what should we do in 23 minutes? How about review the entire semester? How can we possibly do that? Well, we can't really, except in very, very vague terms, but I think it's still worthwhile to do. Summarize Robin stats in, well, now effectively 22 minutes. Chapter one, what was it about? The basics of probability. Right? We're trying to get to the statistics. We're trying to use probability models for statistics. That's what the, our statistics has been all about. So we need to learn probability first. And so what was in chapter one? Basic things like, well, what is probability? There's the personal opinion approach. There's the relative frequency approach. Like, What's the probability of getting heads when I flip a coin? Is it really 0.5 or not? Well, the relative frequency approach would say, no, it's not necessarily. It's approximately what you get when you flip the coin many, many times. What proportion of them are heads? Should be close to 50%. If you flip that coin 10,000 times, will you get exactly 50%? Probably not. Probably something more like you know, 0.493 or something. Is that truly what the probability of heads is? Probably not either, but it's good enough as an approximation. But of course, there's the theoretical approach as well with sample spaces and just logic to say the probability of heads is 0.5. More importantly, there's uh, the, the idea of sample spaces, sample spaces and events is what I'm trying to write there. Hard to see maybe sample spaces and events, there's the, uh, and to, if you've got finite sample spaces, you need the counting rules, you've got the multiplication principle, which is really just telling you what multiplication means effectively, right? If you've got 10 ways of doing one thing and 20 ways of doing another, how many ways do you have of doing both things together? 10 times 20, 200. The multiplication principle leads to the formula for permutations. And that leads to the formula for combinations. NPR and NCR or N choose R if you like. This one being N factorial over R factorial times N minus R factorial. This one being N factorial over N minus R factorial. Permutate, when you apply these ideas, permutations, the order matters, combination, the, the order does not matter. It's like picking for a club, a president, treasurer, and secretary, the order matters, versus just picking three people to go to a conference, the order doesn't matter. Sometimes problem solving is tricky, so you got to practice. But remember, I've been giving you possibly problems like on the old exams, so you've got a good idea what to practice. Chapter two. Uh, more theoretical probability. We've got the axioms. One axiom being that probabilities are never negative. They're always greater than or equal to zero. Another axiom being the probability that the, of the sample space occurring, P of S is one, meaning something's got to occur. And the third one, is essentially the addition rule for mutually exclusive events. If A and B are mutually exclusive, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. Venn diagrams are useful for conceptualizing that and solving problems as well. It applies to more than two events that are all mutually exclusive. And then you have things you can prove from that. Probability of the empty set is zero. You've got the Complement rule, probability of A plus the probability of its complement is one. 
you've got then that generalizes to the general addition rule. <clears throat> probability of A or B in general is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. Makes sense with Venn diagrams. Examples like cards and things like that helps you understand that. Conditional probability. Conditional probability of A given B by definition is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And this leads to the general multiplication rule that the probability of A and B, A intersect B is the probability of B times the, prob the conditional probability of A given B. And by symmetry, that is also equal to the probability of A times the conditional probability of B given A. By symmetry. Independence comes next. By definition, A and B are independent if the conditional probability equals the ordinary probability. But that's equivalent to, in a theorem, the multiplication rule for independent events, which is really our, our, probably our most important equation of the semester right there. Right? We use that all the time. Chapters three and beyond. We use this formula, for example, to derive the formula for binomial random variable probabilities, the probability mass function for that. We used it in chapter five when talking about joint densities and when are two random variables independent. And we needed that assumption because we use, we assume random variables are independent a lot in later chapters, like in doing statistics. Got a random sample, a random sample is a list of independent random variables with that all have the same distribution. It's really important. There's also Bayes' theorem. I'm not gonna write it down, but you might remember it's useful to think about tree diagrams to help you solve problems with Bayes' theorem. Chapter three was about discrete random variables. So we're applying chapter two to thinking about variables that are random variables, meaning their values are determined by chance according to certain probability models. You've got the theory of what is a PMF labeled PDF in the book. PMF means probability mass function. CDF is a sum of PMF values. Expected values, expected value, um, mean, variance, standard deviation, moment generating functions. That's all part of the theory from the beginning of chapter three. With the expected values, you also have properties of expected values like linearity, which again is this property here is, is, is it sounds very reasonable, but it's actually difficult to prove. It's probably the most reasonable sounding property when you think about it with examples that there is that's not very easy to prove that I can think of. Then you've got particular random variables. We started with geometric, where X counts the number of trials until the first success. It's a, it's a Bernoulli trial situation where you either have success or failure. On any given trial, the probability of success is constant. Trials are independent. X counts the number of trials until the first success. 
got a certain probability mass function based on that that you can use, certain mean, certain variance based on the parameter P. The mean in particular is one over P. You remember that for geometric? You know, if you got a 10% chance of success on any one trial, on average, it's going to take you one over 0 0.1, 10 trials till your first success. Binomial was next, where now you've got two parameters, N and P. N is the total number of trials. X is the total number of successes, like shooting free throws. You could have zero successes. X could take on a value of zero through N. And the PMF formula involves N choose X and some powers of P and one minus P. The mean is N times P. Variance is n times p times q, where q is 1 minus p. Those, are, of course, are all in the tables, but I hope the mean at least makes sense. Should be able to derive these things with moment generating functions. Know the purpose of moment generating functions here. We skipped some other random variables like hypergeometric and negative binomial and went on to Poisson random variables. which counts the number of things as well. You could call them successes, but they don't traditionally call them successes. Over some time interval, typically, like the number of rock noises was in a common example we thought about over an hour, number of earthquakes, number of tornadoes. This is applicable to a lot of insurance problems where you're thinking about catastrophes. The PMF formula involves E and factorials. The parameter, it was called K, and K could be thought of as lambda times S. K ends up being the mean. K and lambda are the same if S is one. S is like, you know, lambda is like your average number of occurrences during a unit time interval, like say a year or something. And S might be the number of years, which could be two or three years, but it also could be a half a year. K being lambda times S is ultimately the mean for the time interval that you're thinking about, say for a number of earthquakes in a half a year. Chapter four, continuous random variables. Got a right messy here. That says continuous random variables. Again, we have the theory. Now we call them PDFs, probability density functions, whose values do not give you probabilities. You have to integrate them to find probabilities. Still CDF, still the other stuff as well that have the same kind of general formulas, but to find use the general formulas, you have to do integrals now instead of summations. Particular random variables. We started with uh, a complicated one, the gamma distribution. And that led to uh, exponential and chi-square. We also talked about sort of cookbook, well, user-defined PDFs, like, you know, f of x equals some constant times x cubed or something over some interval. Right, I think there was a problem on an exam like that. You got to figure out what the constant is to make it a valid PDF. Should be able to handle problems like that too. Um, normal, gamma, subdistributions, exponential chi-squared and normal were the main particular random variables in chapter four. There are plenty of others, we just don't cover them. I guess we did talk about the uniform as well, mostly in the context of simulation. Then we got into actuarial science a bit. There were two handouts that you should study to try to understand again. The first handout was focused on modeling people's lifetimes, right? Lifetime random variable, introducing new functions like the survival function and the force of mortality. 
You're trying to model how long somebody lives. You're not thinking about money. Second handout brings in money, the time value of money based on interest rates, I, and the discount factor V is one over one plus I. And ultimately they were interested in like, especially means of present value random variables. You got a payment at a random time in the future. What's its present value based on some interest rate? It's a random variable. So how do we model it? What's its mean? What's its variance standard deviation? There were discrete things to think about in there as well. Curtate random variables. And there were also some information about annuities. But, you know, the problem if I put it on the test will be like the one that was on exam two. So you have to focus on that. Chapter five, continuing with theoretical probability was multivariable random variables, mostly focused on two random variables, bivariate random variables. Both in the discrete and continuous, discrete and continuous. You do summations for discrete, you do integrals for continuous. In both cases, you have the idea of a joint density. Technically in the discrete case, it's a joint mass function, probability mass function. In the continuous case, it's really a joint density. Uh, you also have conditional And marginal, you should probably do the marginal first. Marginal, marginal, because I can spell marginal, conditional, right? With the discrete case, the marginal densities are found just by adding across the rows and down the columns of your table, say. In the continuous case, they're found by doing integrals with respect to one of the variables, integrate out one of the variables to get a marginal density for the other. The conditional densities are ratios, joint density divided by marginal density. And what was most interesting to me in there was the curves of regression. which are means of conditional density. There also was discussed, um, what does independence truly mean? Independence. Means the joint density is the product of the marginal densities. That's the definition of independence of random variables. There's also the covariance and it's related to expected values. And if the random variables are independent, the covariance is zero. This is what Dr. Wetzel talked about. But the covariance being zero doesn't mean the variables are necessarily independent. Unfortunately. Chapter six is descriptive statistics. What's a random sample? Population, sample, random sample of really random variables. I probably should just say random sample, meaning a list of random variables that are all independent and have the same distribution. What is a statistic? It's not a number, it's a function of the random variables. It is itself a random variable, it's got a distribution. In order to do our theory, you need to realize that. There were things about graphs with histograms and stem plots and ogives, and you should be able to make those basic kinds of graphs like came up on the test if they did, I forgot. Um, I'll just say graphs. Then you actually have your estimators like capital X bar and S squared and S. 
And then in chapter seven, we get the, into the theory of estimators, estimation theory. You know, X bar is unbiased. What does that mean? It means its expected value is mu. Uh, S squared is unbiased. So its expected value is sigma squared. S you should know is not unbiased. The expected value of S is not sigma, unfortunately but true, you have to live with it. Uh, the variance of X bar is sigma squared over N. Then you have our favorite things like the fingerprint theorem and the fact about moment generating functions that if X and Y, it's a separate thing, X and Y are independent. That implies the moment generating function of their sum is the sum of the moment is the product of the moment generating functions. And that was a very useful thing when combining with the fingerprint to figure out distributions of sums, for example, sums of normal random variables, independent normal random variables are, in, are also normal. Sums of independent chi-squared random variables are also chi-squared. Sums of exponential random variables are not exponential. That came up somewhere. Sum of two exponential random variables with the same um, mean, at least, is gamma with alpha equal to two, I think. You can use moment generating functions to derive that. I think that came up on one exam. Um, we also had, okay, we're almost out of time here. Also had um, some other important things like how about the central limit theorem? CLT, central limit theorem. Cornerstone theorem, which talks about the mean, what's the distribution of X bar when this, you're sampling from a normal distribution. It's also normal. Central limit theorem is, even if you're sampling from a non-normal distribution, your X bar is approximately normal. After that point, in 30 seconds, that's when we got into stats. Chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. Eight, mostly about the fundamentals of uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis testings for single means, though we did talk about it in the context of binomial random variables as well. Things about null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, what's a type one error, what's a type two error, what's the power, that kind of stuff. Um, fundamental ideas. Chapter nine, we transition into applying that to both uh, doing, thinking about individual variances and also, no, that was at the end of chapter eight. Chapter nine is more about proportions, both for single proportions and comparing proportions. Chapter 10, we went back to means, comparing means. T distribution comes into play with means, but not proportions. F distribution for comparing variances. Then chapter 11, regression. <sighs> I hope that felt like a worthwhile thing to remind you in broad terms of everything we did. Hope you enjoyed the course. See you on Monday for the test.